welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you had fruitful and engaging discussions. It's, it certainly looked as if uh, I was looking into the into the roundtables from time to time, and uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed it. Now is the time where we uh, gather a bit what actually has been discussed and report from the different groups. And I'm very happy um, that two of our moderators, Annalisa Piras and Christoph Lanz, are already with us. We have some live action here. I suppose uh, Mrs. Borchert is going to join us in a second. She's in a room, I think, one floor up, but will join us in a second. And on a procedural note, I would suggest what we do is we just hear briefly from the moderators um, uh, what actually was discussed in their respective groups. And then we, we sort of summarize it. And I really want to encourage you also to, to chime in and, and um, share with us your thoughts, your impressions, uh, and also maybe your, your demands when it comes to concrete recommendations that come out of this um, colloquium today. So now's the time really for interaction also between the strategic roundtables. But first, without further ado, um, I'd like to pass the mic to Annalisa Piras who's going to familiarize us a bit with uh, the discussions in the Strategic Roundtable New, Beginning, New Beginnings Leadership in Post-COVID Times. Annalisa, please. Is this working? Yeah. Hello there. Thank you very much for uh, joining us online. Uh, and again, uh, apologies for uh, the, the little technical problems that we have had. So our working group uh, had a very challenging and ambitious uh, subject. Uh, it was uh, leadership in uh, post-COVID uh, times. But we had uh, quite a productive uh, reflection on many aspects of this uh, question. Uh, first of all, on um, we, to simplify the kind of uh, uh, discussion, we, we choose to use uh, an image that was created at the beginning of the pandemic by the great uh, Indian novelist Arundhati Roy, who reminded us that uh, pandemics in history have always been uh, a moment of renewal and change. They've uh, signed the break between uh, the old and the new. And so we were wondering uh, if we have to uh, embrace this image of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as a portal, as a gateway to the future. What uh, do we need to leave behind and uh, what do we bring through if we want to travel lightly and uh, uh, not go back to business as usual, which would be, of course, uh, the foolish thing the foolishest thing to do, because we know that so many things were wrong. So we try to imagine uh, what we have seen through the pandemic that is, uh, is, uh, is wrong and it needs to belong to the past. Regarding leadership, uh, we have uh, understood that uh, uh, one big problem of leadership uh, almost everywhere in the world has been uh, the tempo the speed at which it has reacted and adapted to these constant um, new uh, challenges that the virus was uh, uh, bringing to leaders. And uh, we have also seen uh, a, a dramatic uh, uh, gap between uh, the, the choices of the leaders, the science, and the way the science was communicated to people. So one big lesson for a new way of leader uh, of uh, intending leadership uh, is that the new leaders need to be extremely more competent uh, and uh, uh, prepared not only to discern the science but also to communicate it and the media need to play a much bigger role in supporting this because most of the problems that we've seen especially in the west about wearing masks not wearing masks were a direct consequence of uh, the inability to communicate clearly and the inability of the media to actually support uh, science uh, during these incredibly unsettling times. So new leaders need to be better at understanding science and at communicating it, and the media have a big role to play there. So, and another thing that uh, we discussed is uh, the, the disaster of uh, uh, the leadership of thinking that solutions would be national. And this was a tragedy because we saw so many uh, national disjointed initiatives. But at the same time, it brought with it uh, an added value because the citizens all over the world have understood that national solutions don't always work. So there is a better understanding and a better awareness of uh, 
the need to have a, a, a transnational action. And also we have learned that through the pandemic, uh, we have learned that working together could work. Uh, when the EU launched the joint uh, procurement initiative. Yes, it didn't work at the beginning, but people understood that that was the way forward. So we have seen also uh, a model of leadership across borders that could work. And the Professor Alemano was actually quite rightly in his uh, um, introduction pointing at the fact that now that we're facing uh, one of the worst energy crises uh, in history, and that this uh, winter is going to be tragic for a lot of people. The idea that we have seen through the pandemic leaders uh, buying things like uh, vaccines together could provide a model that citizens could understand of maybe procuring energy together. And again, the role of the media here is key in supporting uh, this. So to conclude, um, we have seen a lot of changes and there will be even more opportunities to develop in the future. And uh, the, the key is uh, to bring back the idea of a public good and a public good that can be achieved together through nations. Uh, the media have a big role to play and one uh, important uh, thought, uh, I think, to leave to the plenary is that um, a lot of things have changed and we know that the business model of media uh, is not working as it should. So in this new thinking, going through this gate, we need also to bring back and rejuvenate ideas like uh, the nature of information as a public good and uh, the need to think of uh, ways of funding it uh, through maybe the role of the state needs to come back at the center of the debate because uh, the complexity of the changes that we live are such uh, of such difficulty that uh, we need more than ever qualified information. We need arbiters of truth. We need people that uh, know that they can go somewhere where they can trust information as a public good given out as a public service and not as a commodity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Annalisa. That was very, very um, impressive and informative. And I think I got the sense that even though you had a very limited time, as we all had in, in, in these roundtables, you really adopted a very holistic conception or idea of what leadership um, is about, which uh, I think is uh, very timely and, and, and much needed. Now, we get to the role of the media and, and public communication, which you alluded to uh, in a moment, but I first want to pass the mic to actually to Christoph Lanz, who chaired the, um, the second roundtable, since you also mentioned transnational cooperation, right, as a, the, the capacity for transnational cooperation, but also the mindset for transnational cooperation. And this, needless to say, brings us to Europe and the state of Europe and our second round table, Fit for the Job, Europe's Role in a New World Order. Christoph, please. Yeah, if you expect a clear answer, fit for the job, yes or no, you won't get it. Well, you are, but <laughs> you are fit for the job of, of moderating, that's for sure, because... I hope. <laughs> I gave my very best. But uh, actually, um, uh, we uh, could not find a clear yes or no to the answer, fit for the job. Um, what I would um, uh, point out at the beginning is that we... Uh, I think mainly agreed that uh, econ economically the European Union is doing a good job, but uh, militarily uh, it's, uh, it's a problem. And uh, the question is whether, or one of the questions that we discussed, whether uh, we should as Europe try uh, to become strategically uh, so autonomous uh, that we, for example, uh, wouldn't need the US capacities. There were some uh, people in our panel that were in favor of that position, but the, I would say, um, mainstream of the discussion was that we will never get to the point that we will be strategically uh, autonomous as some might want it. Um, and uh, another point uh, that uh, uh, we discussed were the question whether uh, European values are um, outdated or not. And I would say that the clear answer was no, they are not, and uh, we uh, should uh, keep our faith and uh, believe in, in these values and uh, keep on uh, uh, to propagate them. Um, I don't want to, to share with you the outcome of our session alone, and so I asked Tobias Endler from the University of Heidelberg to uh, help me out as a sidekick. Tobias, how would you sum up the results of our session? 
I guess you can sum up like 12 bright minds discussing in a, in a room such a complex topic. But I, I might just add, I think, that our discussion took place on two separate levels at the same time. So there was an inside-out perspective on Europe, uh, if you want, from Greece, from Kosovo, on the question of the need for institutional reform uh, in Europe, for example, getting from consensus to majority decisions and so on. Also the question whether expanding the European Union at the moment is feasible and a good idea in the first place, which was uh, debated rather heatedly, uh, I would say. And then on a second level, we were looking at Europe from the outside, and that's something that Christopher, I think, just outlined uh, beautifully, and we seem to reach the point where there's a double challenge currently. Europe needs to consolidate on the inside, it was being said, and grow up on the outside at the same time, grow up into its global responsibility as an economic uh, heavyweight, but still a military uh, lightweight. And the question whether we can, as Europeans, actually reach strategic autonomy uh, at all, some of us tended to answer in the way that maybe we don't have much of a choice, but starting to, uh, to think and work on that idea and maybe develop a grand strategy for Europe, since the world is changing around us with the United States turning inward, uh, as Christopher Walker said, turning away from Europe towards Asia, as was said repeatedly, China making its stake, its claim, and Russia following its own uh, policy interests. So maybe Europe doesn't have much of a choice but to start aiming for strategic autonomy. But, and I think that was something that, that everybody could agree on, not against the United States, which would be foolhardy and wouldn't even make sense uh, geographically because there can't be a second West. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias. Uh, what I would like uh, to add is, uh, you talked about it, uh, that we have to uh, reform the decision-making uh, process within the European Union. One uh, of the uh, uh, participants of the session called for majority decisions. Nevertheless, I think we all agreed there has to be uh, reform regarding the decision-making process within uh, the European Union. Another point uh, that was made was, was we allowed China to divide us, or Europe in general is, um, uh, has to be uh, very um, open-minded to the, to the point that others are splitting us up and we have to uh, check whether we are just a, a couple of countries that are easily to be split up or whether we find a, a common uh, position, especially if we talk about foreign uh, policy here. And uh, what I would also recall from the session was that um, Russia is um, just um, economically seen um, just a, a minor, minor player in the big game. But we, as strong, economically strong Europe, um, uh, are uh, uh, under pressure from, from that Russia. And uh, let, us put under, uh, let us be put under pressure by Russia. So why is this? That was another question that was uh, raised. And um, uh, yeah, last but not least, uh, we had uh, from Romania, a participant from the Young European Journalists. And um, uh, we asked her how she sees um, Europe and um, what her feelings are. And uh, what she gave us as feedback, and I think this is something that, that uh, participants from the, the core European states uh, should listen very carefully to. She said, we are in deep trouble politically in Romania, but what we're missing is solidarity from the European Union. And this is one point that was stressed several times in that session, that we, among ourselves, have to become united. First of all, Europe has to become really united because, before we can face the external questions. That's it. Thanks so much, Christoph. Thank you. Uh, division, which you mentioned, uh, is also a phenomenon that sort of preoccupied us within our societies, uh, uh, many of them. Um, at least, and that, needless to say, has to do, of course, with the role of uh, media and the role of science in times of the uh, pandemic. Key, as we all know, integral and at the same time uh, contested. And that was the subject of our third round table, a matter of fact, trust, science and journalism in perilous times. Alexander, please. 
Yeah, thank you. I have to bring you back now from the world stage and, and uh, China and the US and Europe in the middle to, to the nitty gritty, um, to, the, to the nitty gritty detail of the daily doings in newsrooms. And we were fortunate enough to, to listen to an input uh, by Wolfgang Blau, who's, who's put a lot of time and effort uh, into studying uh, cl the climate change coverage of newsrooms in recent years as one of the, the major topic, maybe the topic uh, um, it, that is so important for journalism these days, in particular for young audiences. And, and uh, we've come across this uh, every time also I, as a researcher, that for young audiences, climate change, global warming is really the topic that they're most interested in. And uh, what we learned from Wolfgang, from his research, is really that newsrooms really need to ramp up on climate literacy. Uh, we always talked about digital literacy and media literacy, but really there's not that much climate literacy, uh, neither in the population, but not, on the, also not in newsrooms. But this is so important because we need a common set of metrics to even communicate the basics of climate science, of, of climate change uh, to, to the public, to discuss it with the public, and, and we really need an agreement Agreement. And, and for that, we really need to ramp up a climate literacy in newsrooms. Uh, we also had uh, some voices, Sabine Schickelanz, from Potsdam here, a small city, this, this city right here, that actually climate change is so much more felt now with, with uh, old trees dying right in the middle of Potsdam. But as a small newsroom, uh, she feels like sh sh small newsrooms don't have the capacity uh, really to, to, to report on this um, in, in a very... Uh, knowledgeable and, and also localized fashion that is very close to the people. The same we heard uh, from the, the CEO of, of uh, Lithuanian Public Broadcasting. She said, this is a small country and, and really our audiences, young audiences, really want to know something about climate change. They, they really want to uh, want to know something about the subject, but it's it's really hard to, to find literacy. And we had voices in the room, and I'm so thankful for, for having so many knowledgeable participants in this room who said that really needs to be in alliance, too, between scientists and journalists to, to really make sure uh, everyone is understanding what's going on and to familiarize uh, each other with the, the details. And also... Um, to transport to the public that uh, science is not always certainty, but uh, the basis of science is also a doubt and, and disproving what someone else has found out because this is how progress in science is, is being made. And it's really a challenge and a big task for, for journalism uh, to, to convey this. And, and there, there was one uh, voice who said like, but what can we do? Because very often climate journalism is really uh, put in one basket with uh, sort of the, the, the more the green politics or uh, politics from the left. And, and uh, that is a real issue um, that climate reporting, climate change reporting has been uh, in the middle uh, actually of the, the culture wars. And, and Wolfgang also said that, that sometimes he, he gets the question like, do you believe in climate change? But this is not a belief. Science is established uh, fact. You don't believe in, uh, you know, two plus two is, is four. So really establish uh, first of all, the yes, this is happening, and, and then uh, developing ways to, to transport simple metrics to people, as we did last year with our, our, uh, in, in the ongoing pandemic, with simple metrics that, that people understood uh, what was going on. And in fact, uh, the pandemic has led to increased trust in journalism. This is often a misconception. There's very often the debate that there is less trust in journalism, but this is not true. Trust overall, as also the Digital News Report revealed uh, this year, rose uh, across all markets globally by six percentage points in media, and it is fairly low in social media and search. So, so traditional media, the big brands uh, with, with their newsrooms struggling every day uh, to convince people or, or to, to, to communicate with their audiences, uh, they really have a big plus in trust and they need to capitalize on this. And it is a, a radical uh, minority that is not following, um, uh, that, that is, is uh, calling uh, into question the value of journalism, but actually the majority is really uh, trusting journalists, so journalists need to make 
the most of this. And, and this was uh, basically also what we then we discussed. Um, yeah, how can a, a, a future looking journalism uh, look like? And we were fortunate enough to have Ulrich Hagerup there from Constructive Institute in Aarhus. And, uh, and we discussed a bit how can we do uh, more constructive um, journalism on climate change? Because if people get only catastrophe and, and drama in their newsfeed, uh, they go into hiding. That's a psychological effect. Uh, so how can you frame the story uh, that it's, it's constructive and you can talk about solutions and Ulrich said, uh, you have to get the facts first. And, and uh, he also raised some hopes and, and uh, raised some appetite for constructive journalism. He, he, he just uh, mentioned that they just organized political events in Denmark and, and they organized this constructive political debate and that was sold out after uh, just a few, few hours because people are fed up with confrontation. People want really constructive ways to get out of this mess. And this is what we agreed about. Wow, thanks so much, Alexander, for this dense and, and super informative uh, summary of what's been discussed. I'm, I'm amazed how much you, you can actually discuss in, uh, in, in an hour. But uh, yeah, that just comes to show uh, how it works here at M100. So thank you very much. Also for reminding us that indeed the pandemic, far from over, is not the only crazy crisis we're dealing with and broadening the perspective uh, somewhat also when it comes to our discussion uh, about journalism, uh, when in fact it's about much more. It's about our societies at large, it's about public communication, understanding uh, in our societies. And even though the, the, there's this constant re refrain of a future fit, future proof journalism, we've been dis we're discussing this all the time. We've been discussing it for years and we need to because uh, things things change. I'm very glad that you uh, ended also on a sort of optimistic or constructive um, note. Um, I really think we shouldn't leave this conference or this part of the conference rather without giving the other participants at least the opportunity to, to chime in briefly. Is there anything you want to share with us? Anything uh, that has been forgotten so far? Anything that, that needs to be um, and, 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 and should be addressed when it comes to uh, what we just heard and when it comes to the broader conference theme of democratic resilience? Now is the opportunity. Uh, I have a screen in front of me. If, if you would like to share your views, also your, your recommendations, uh, please just raise your virtual hand and make, make yourself seen. Is there anyone who wants to, to share something? Um, if not, um, I, don't, I don't see anyone, I don't see all the tiles. Uh, <laughs> well, but uh, um, there's still, there still many um, opportunities in the future because, as you know, um, uh, this is not uh, um, the end. This is the uh, end of this part uh, of the program. Uh, we'll be going into a little uh, break now where you have the opportunity to virtually network uh, via um, WonderMe, which is an, uh, an app I believe you can use, or basically it's, I think it's browser-based, so you don't need to install anything. And if you don't have the link already, uh, I think it'll be on the chat now. And again, it's the opportunity to sort of connect with each other and use the 45-minute break that we now have um, to perhaps elaborate further on um, some of the topics um, that we just addressed and just talked about. Uh, having said that, I think there's a lot more that we should and need, need to discuss, and I'm very much looking forward to how we look at things one year from now. Uh, if, no, when, we definitely will, will reconvene uh, at um, M100. But again, this is, not, uh, this is not the end of our program. This is the end of the, the uh, more condensed version of the colloquium. Uh, we will be going into um, another keynote at 5 p.m. Um, on Resilience and Late Modernity by Professor Andreas Reckwitz, uh, followed by a special talk on the total totalitarian temptation with uh, Chan Dünda, Claudia Major, and Saad Moseni. And afterwards, as you all know, is the festive award ceremony for Alexei Navalny here out of the Schloss Theater in um, Potsdam. And now, I think it's time to, to wrap it up, and I pass the mic to Sabine, please. Yeah, thank you very much for contributing to our conference and people who cannot join us here in person uh, are welcome to follow the speech of Mr. Reckwitz and the special talk and uh, the award ceremony 
on our live stream on www.potsdammonehundred.org. The live stream starts at five o'clock um, CET. Hope to see you there. Have a nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Sabine. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to all the speakers. Thanks for your inputs, uh, the lively discussions, and also for your patience during some of the technical difficulties that we faced today. But a hybrid Zoom format wouldn't be one if we wouldn't face and wouldn't overcome such challenges. Thank you very much. See you later. <laughs>